In this video, I'm going to talk about the problem of intermediary liability. So the question here is, when should someone uh, or an entity that is an intermediary uh, be liable for the speech that it ends up facilitating? Particularly thinking about online intermediaries. So for example, uh, if I post something on Facebook which defames someone else, uh, I may be liable, of course, for defamation. But the question is, should Facebook be liable? Or should Facebook be liable at least under particular kinds of uh, conditions. Now, notice that in situations like this, it might actually make sense in some ways to make these kinds of intermediaries liable. Because after all, the individuals who are posting things that are either, for example, defamatory, invade people's privacy, or otherwise harmful to other kinds of individuals, might be actually very difficult to control through law. Such individuals might, for example, be in a different jurisdiction, uh, outside of the, the reach of particular national uh, courts or national systems. Uh, such individuals, even when they are within the, the same jurisdiction, uh, might be uh, difficult to identify to the extent to which um, uh, they uh, post or interact uh, with the internet in, in, in ways that are not explicitly uh, tied to their identity. Um, and even when they can be identified and directly sued in this way, uh, it may be very difficult to get any kind of judgment out of them, uh, with the ultimate result that it may be very difficult to deter them from continuing to act in the ways that they're acting, uh, because it's not in fact possible to, uh, for example, deter them monetarily um, from uh, defaming people or invading people's privacy in that way. And so there are reasons why, in fact, it would seem relatively natural to focus on intermediaries, uh, particularly online intermediaries, as the way to try to control the problem of uh, harmful speech online. Uh, but in fact, many systems, in the US for example in particular, uh, provide for either diminished uh, liability for these kinds of intermediaries or, for, or uh, in some cases outright immunity. So the United States, for example, has uh, 47 USC section 230, uh, a provision which provides for uh, essentially an absolute immunity uh, to intermediaries um, when they carry the speech of others. This immunity does not apply to intellectual property claims um, and to a few other narrowly defined claims, but for example, the uh, mass of civil, defamatory, or uh, privacy claims uh, would be covered by this. And so, uh, under this particular law in the United States, uh, Facebook is not at all liable for the defamatory content that it carries, or for the privacy invading content that it carries. And indeed, it's not liable even upon notice. So there's, this is, there's not even any kind of notice and takedown system here. Even upon notice, Facebook could ignore the notice and still enjoy immunity under this particular US law. So what justifies this diminished liability or this immunity for intermediaries? The idea here, as generally uh, stated, is that we're worried about chilling effects. So this is the general um, uh, view on why it is that we have some kind of intermediary, intermediary immunity, some kind of diminished liability for these kinds of cases. We're worried about the chilling effect that can be result, uh, that can result from imposing liability on these intermediaries, where, as a result, they end up taking down content, um, and taking down content that includes content that is not, in fact, unlawful. Right? And so that's the, we're worried about uh, chilling that kind of speech um, in these kinds of cases. But notice that the chilling effects argument, at least by itself, does not fully explain why we want to have less liability for intermediaries than we do for individual speakers. Because after all, any time we impose liability upon speakers, we might potentially be worried about a chilling effect. Right, the very existence of laws against defamation, or laws against invading people's privacy, or anything of the sort, has the potential to chill speech. Because individuals who are potentially faced with these kinds of liability, who are even potentially faced with a lawsuit along these, along these lines, might be reluctant to speak, for example, true things that they can't back up if they in fact think that they will ultimately be uh, sued for defamation. Right? So any kind of liability for speech has the potential to chill speech. So it cannot be that chilling effect by itself necessarily explains why we treat intermediaries differently from the original speaker of the, of the information. The reason why the chilling effects argument works, or the reason why we in fact 
have diminished liability for intermediaries is really the idea that the chilling effect is different with respect to intermediaries as with respect to original speakers. That original speakers face different kinds of incentives to speak than intermediaries do. And it's that difference in incentives which has the potential to create a much greater chilling effect with respect to intermediaries than it does with respect to individual speakers. Why? Because think about it, right? Who posts, when someone posts something which, for example, might be defamatory or might invade someone's privacy, there are a host of benefits that an individual obtains which are not, in fact, shared by the intermediary. The individual might obtain, for example, reputational benefits in, uh, in, in, the, in having spoken whatever it is uh, that the person writes. Or the person might simply feel a sense of self-actualization. There's a, a kind of value in speaking, an intrinsic value in speaking, which most people feel instinctively and which will drive their speech, uh, even when they don't derive any direct economic value from what it is that they say. I think one only has to go to um, a lot of the, the, the pages on the internet to realize that a lot of people like to talk, um, and they get value out of talking uh, on the internet, even when they aren't being paid for what they say. Now, these are the kinds of benefits, though, that, that original speakers might obtain in the way that, are, that uh, an entity like Facebook uh, or Google or Yahoo or similar kinds of intermediaries online are not going to be able to share it. Moreover, there might be differences in terms of the potential costs of speaking, to the extent to which, for example, the liability hinges upon the truthfulness of what is being said. Original speakers might have much easier and cheaper access to information than the intermediaries will. And so, for example, the cost of verifying what's being said might be substantially higher on the part of intermediaries uh, than it will be on the part of original speakers. So speakers in this way potentially both gain additional benefits from their speech, not shared by speakers, and also uh, not shared by intermediaries, and also potentially face lower costs than, than intermediaries do. With the result being that in the cost-benefit analysis, intermediaries will ultimately censor more speech than an individual would self-censor. And that difference, that difference in what intermediaries would do, the difference in the kind of censorship that results from intermediaries and the kind of self-censorship that results from individuals, it is that difference that, uh, that can explain why it is we would want diminished liability for intermediaries, and potentially even the kind of immunity that the United States provides. Now, it doesn't, of course, conclusively show that. There are, as I described in the beginning, all sorts of reasons why maybe we want to harness the power of intermediaries in order to try to eliminate harmful speech. So the, the relative costs and benefits of having an intermediary uh, immunity regime um, are not established by the argument I've just described, but the argument does at least potentially justify why it is that we have diminished liability uh, for intermediaries in these kinds of situations. And understanding that it is about this difference in chilling effect or the difference in incentives can help us understand uh, a number of, uh, of conceptual problems when it comes to trying to apply uh, a kind of immunity for intermediaries in these settings. First, it will help us to understand what kinds of entities should be regarded as intermediaries in the first place. So, for example, there have been a number of cases in the United States involving individuals that have forwarded emails to others. And in each one of these cases, courts have ultimately held that the individuals who forward the emails are themselves covered by the intermediary immunity law in the United States. That is to say, the person who forwarded the email is not responsible for the defamatory content or otherwise uh, harmful content in the email that they forward. Now, courts have often taken a somewhat formal perspective on this, saying that, well, ultimately, the information that the individuals are forwarding are information that originated somewhere else. Someone else is the one that, in some sense, came up with uh, the facts or information uh, that are being forwarded, or came up with the falsity if, in fact, it turns out to be defamatory. But I think this misunderstands what it actually means to be an intermediary in this context. Because those individuals who are forwarding emails are generally positioned similarly to those who are actually originating the email in the first place. Indeed, those who originate the email may not have themselves 
for example, originated the underlying facts. A rule that says that you can forward emails and still be immune is basically a rule that says you can spread rumors as much as you like, so long as you heard the rumor from somewhere else. As long as you weren't the one that made up the rumor, uh, you should be free to spread it. But that doesn't seem to make much sense relative to our theory about why it is that we protect intermediaries in the first place. Those who are forwarding on these rumors or otherwise forwarding on content in this way really should be regarded as original speakers in their own right. Original speakers who admittedly are saying the same words or repeating the same content that came from somewhere else. But original speakers because they face a lot of the same incentives as those uh, uh, whose email they received. Uh, these are also going to be individuals who obtain similar kinds of reputational benefits from uh, the forwarded email, who obtain a similar kind of sense of self-actualization, for example, and who might be as close to the original facts as the uh, person from whom they ultimately uh, received the email. It's not clear that there's been such a, uh, there's any sense in which uh, uh, they should be regarded as uh, sufficiently different in kind uh, that it would be much more difficult for them to, um, uh, to be able to, to check facts uh, than the person uh, whose email it is that they forwarded. Um, so all of this suggests that uh, in the email forwarding cases, we really should not be regarding those who forward emails as the kind of intermediaries that we mean to protect. Looking specifically at the way in which the U.S. statute is framed, uh, perhaps the better way of understanding what the statute covers is not that it covers individuals who forward the same facts, who in some sense pass along the same facts that in some sense originated elsewhere, but that it's really meant to protect those who pass along or process the same bits as, uh, uh, as bits that, that really did originate elsewhere. That ultimately, in the situation of someone who forwards an email, they're really uh, creating a, a kind of independent set of bits, an independent set of, um, uh, an independent email, as it were, uh, that happens to contain the same informational content as the email that they received. Uh, and then this should be distinguished from, for example, an entity like uh, Facebook or Google or traditional ISPs, for example, uh, that are designed to process these bits uh, in one sense or another, uh, to be able to move them along uh, to their ultimate destination. Similarly, this understanding of why it is that we protect intermediaries can help us to potentially differentiate among different kinds of claims that might be brought against intermediaries in this way. So, for example, it helps us to understand why a contract claim against an intermediary is not uh, the same as, for example, a defamation claim. In the case of a contract claim, unlike in the case of a defamation claim, the kind of liability that we are imposing is a liability that's conditioned upon actions that the intermediary itself took, and which is tied to the actions that the intermediary itself took. See, the trouble with applying a defamation claim to an intermediary is not just that the intermediary is differently situated from the original speaker, but that the law fails to recognize this difference. That the defamation claim itself is functionally the same, whether or not it's the intermediary or the original speaker who is sued. The penalties that, that are being imposed are the same, and the underlying, contact that, con uh, the underlying conduct that generates those penalties um, are supposedly the same. So we're trying to apply the same kind of law, the same kind of liability, to an individual who, as I've argued, is in fact differently situated. But in the context of a contract claim, we have no such difference. So while it's true, of course, that the intermediary well, still thinks different incentives than the original speaker, the contract liability is based upon the particular uh, acts that the uh, intermediary itself took, and which is tailored to those acts. So whatever it is that the intermediary has promised, that's the extent of its liability. That's a kind of liability that differs substantially in kind from the liability that results from an underlying defamation claim or the like. Similarly, it can help us to see the distinction among liability for different kinds of content. So, for example, if we think about liability for carrying a virus, for example, or other kinds of malware um, uh, on a computer system, in these kinds of cases, Although it's still information that is being sent around, 
And although it's still true that, for example, the intermediary is not the one uh, that has originated this information, and in these cases it really is just passing along the bits, it's not clear in these cases whether or not we should regard the intermediary as being particularly differently situated from the original speaker, as it were, from whoever happens to be the one that was originally passing along uh, uh, the virus uh, or other kinds of malware. Because in this case, the quote, speaker, to the extent to which we should regard that person as a speaker at all, uh, is not particularly gaining any benefits from uh, trying to pass along this malware, unless, of course, they're malicious benefits, um, uh, and, uh, and does, not, uh, does not face a similar difference in cost with respect to what it would take to detect uh, the existence of this malware. If anything, indeed, the intermediary may be better positioned to be able to aggregate a large a quantity of data and be able to more efficiently uh, uh, wipe out malware than, than the individuals that might be uh, passing along uh, uh, this malware uh, uh, to begin with. Um, and so in these kinds of situations, um, the kinds of differences that I've identified, differences that are tied really to the speech value of the information that's being transmitted, doesn't seem to apply, which suggests that, for example, intermediary immunity in the context of uh, security problems is not nearly as justified as it is uh, in the context of, for example, claims for defamation or claims for invading privacy. I think intellectual property provides a kind of middle example. Uh, because on the one hand, we could view the intellectual property situation as being very similar to the defamation situation. We can view a similar kind of chilling effect um, happening in which intermediaries have less of an incentive to pass along um, the kind of content that individuals might produce uh, than the individuals themselves might have. For example, you know, um, uh, content that incorporates con uh, other kinds of copyrighted content um, uh, or that, uh, you know, that is otherwise designed to um, uh, transform that content or at least use it in a, in a new, new kind of way. So for example, uh, one case involved a mother who filmed her toddler dancing to uh, a prince song. Uh, this is the sort of speech that I think, again, in which the mother, of course, obtains all sorts of benefits by being wanting to post this and share this with the world of her, of, uh, uh, her son uh, dancing to this song in this way uh, that are entirely unshared. Uh, by the intermediary, and therefore there are going to be a similar kinds of differences um, in the incentives faced by the original speaker, in this case, as by the intermediary. On the other hand, those differences might not be nearly so stark in situations in which, for example, um, complete songs are being uploaded to some kind of file sharing site or something of the sort. Um, in these kinds of situations, it's not clear that the individuals are obtaining the same kinds of benefits that I've described uh, with respect to the kinds of posts that might turn out to be defamatory or privacy invading. Um, and so in these kinds of situations, it's not clear that there'll be the same kind of gap between whatever chilling effect that the uh, underlying liability has upon the individual poster um, as it does on the intermediary whose site is being used to host this particular content. And so this is the sense in which uh, intellectual property potentially sits in the middle, mixes these two kinds of situations, situations in which the uh, theory of intermediary immunity does apply, and those in which the theory is perhaps not as strong. All of this is to say that then this may justify why, for example, under US law, there is a notice and takedown regime with respect to IP claims. Uh, but there's a strong immunity regime with respect to defamation and privacy claims. Some people have regarded this difference as being anomalous. I think that potentially it's actually quite explainable for the reasons that I've just described. Although it may also further suggest that we might want to try to distinguish among different kinds of intellectual property claims. That certain kinds of claims we might want to impose a stronger form of immunity for, and other kinds of intellectual property claims we might want to even consider um, a weaker form of immunity uh, than what is currently provided, for example, under U.S. law. We might, for example, differentiate between um, any form of uh, non-literal copying, any, any form in which 
only, only pieces of a work are being used, or in which something other than a substantially identical copy of the original um, is being posted, uh, from those in which indeed what we have is a substantially identical copy of the original. Um, now, of course, there are all sorts of operational difficulties in separating out these two concepts, and at the end of the day, we may or may not decide that administratively we can, in fact, draw such a line. But I think such a line would at least be justified in theory uh, on the grounds that I've described here. So that's the way in which I think that one can have a much more nuanced understanding of the basis for intermediary immunity, or at least diminished liability for intermediaries, particularly in these kinds of internet context, and the ways in which that understanding then can help us to um, understand where this kind of diminished liability, where this kind of immunity ought to apply, and the circumstances in which such an immunity really ought not to apply.